So last time, so recall what's going on, I've got k, a finite extension of qp, and I was looking at l over k, uh, somehow I had to make some kind of design implementation decision. Uh, and somehow you could either deal with finite extensions or arbitrary extensions, arbitrary algebraic extensions, but what I'm really interested in is somehow arbitrary extensions such that, which are only finitely unramified. I mean, I'm interested in some strange middle, let's, like, let's just have, let's say, let's say L over K. Uh, let's just say, is, a, is algebraic normal inseparable? Separable. Well, we don't need separable because we're in characteristic zero, so uh, so gamma. Uh, then we can look at gal L over K, and we have this. Uh, then we've got gal L over K. This now surjects into ga the Galois group of the residue field K L over K K. There and. Uh, and I need some name for the kernel of this map, uh, which is the inertia subgroup. Let's define I out of a K to be the kernel. There, so that's the inertia subgroup. Uh, then I, I, I out of a K is the inertia subgroup. Of this Gower group, Gower out of a K. Uh, and I'm going to spend a little bit of time saying something about the structure of this thing because you see, this is this is the hard part, right? Because uh, what have we got here? We have uh, we've got some exact sequence I I out of a K lives in Gower out of a K, and the quotient uh, is this thing here? This uh, Gower group of a finite field. So it's going to be uh, uh, gal, gal k l over k k, and uh, k k is finite, and so therefore this Gower group is easy, and therefore, uh, and therefore this Gower, this uh, gal k l over k k, is procyclic, right? Uh, is topologically generated by one element. Uh, generated by one element. So which, maybe I should sell what I'm doing better. The idea is I want to understand what do I really want to do here. Uh, this is the basic object, this finite extension of QP. And what I'm really trying to do is I want to understand the absolute Galois group of this object. So I want to understand Gal K bar over K. Uh, and I'm taking some kind of vaguely historical approach to how one's going to do that. So what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to get, so you could pretend that L is an algebraic closure of K. What I'm trying to do is I'm trying to understand this big, complicated, profinite topological group. And the first observation I'm going to make is that it surjects onto a group which is kind of rather easy. Uh, and the kernel of this map is this inertia group. So really what we have to do is understand this inertia group. OK? So therefore, I mean, I get, and there's also an issue in understanding an extension. Uh, but that's not going to be too hard. Uh, so we want to understand, uh, so to understand to understand gal L over K, we somehow need to focus on this inertia subgroup. Uh, need to focus on, a, on I over K. Uh, and as I say, I'm somehow I'm being a bit brave, uh, kind of letting L over K be, well, I think when I learned this stuff, in my head, L over K was always finite. And I don't think you're going to lose much by pretending that L over K is finite. So my most, most assertions I make, you can check them in the finite case. And sometimes you need finiteness because you have to do a counting argument. 
uh, and then you carefully take some limit and everything's fine. So we better understand uh, this inertia subgroup. So, uh, and of course I guess uh, one thing we can observe uh, is that this, this is a continuous map, this is a Hausdorff thing, so the identity is closed. So the kernel is the preimage of a closed set, so it's closed. So I L of a K is definitely, what's clear is that this inertia subgroup I L of a K is a closed subgroup of Galois of a K. And so therefore, by fundamental theorem of Galois theory, corresponds to some uh, sub-extension, uh, which is going to be I guess the maximal unramified subextension, and that, so therefore, by the oh. so therefore, by fundamental theorem of Galois theory, so I L of a K corresponds to some M uh, L contains M contains K, uh, and the way this is going to work is that this thing here, this going to the Galois group here, is going to be. Uh, the absolute Galois group of the residue field there, and uh, and the Galois group here is going to be uh, I, I L of a K there. So I mentioned this notation before. M is the maximum. The, uh, there are random. There's lots and lots of extensions between L and K, and some of them are ramified and some of them are unramified, and uh, M is somehow the union of all the unramified ones. So M is the union. Of all, of all uh, subfields, of all the subfields of L containing K, which are unramified over K. So that's what's that's what's going on. Uh, right, and I guess I mean one special case that we should perhaps do. Uh, uh, some of the some of the universal case that ultimately we're going to be interested in is when L is when L is. Why am I worried about? Why am I constantly carrying this uh, random extension L when really I'm only interested in L is k bar? That's going to become clear uh, in about two minutes' time when I start talking about filtrations on this inertia group. Uh, so here's some special case, so sort of special interesting case. is when L equals K bar there. And then we have L. So here's the picture then. We've got K bar, and then we've got K down here. Uh, and then we've got this funny, uh, this extension here, which is the maximal unramified extension. So I'll call it KNR. And that goes up to K bar. And this has got Galois group I, K bar over K. Uh, and this has got Galois group, I guess, Z hat canonically Z hat. Uh, because why, why is this canonically Z hat? Because this is, uh, this is um, because gal KNR over K is canonically isomorphic to gal, uh, the residue field, algebraic closure of the residue field over the residue field. And I mentioned in the last lecture that this is a pro-cyclic. Uh, so there we go. So what's this inertia group? Uh, right. Oh, maybe I'll give you a. Maybe I should also say that this, this, this maximal unramified extension is uh, not so mysterious. You see, there's there's two things going on when you do class fill theory and you try to work out what class fill theory says explicitly. There's two stories. It's kind of explicitly working out what the groups are and explicitly working out what the fields are, and they turn out to be two very different stories. Like for a random number field. We could look at somehow the maximal abelian extension of that number field, and we know exactly what the Galois group of that thing is by class field theory, but we don't actually know what the extension is. <laughs> it's sort of funny. The machinery gives you the Galois group, but doesn't say explicitly what the extension is. That's, you know, even working out Hilbert class fields explicitly is kind of a, so a serious issue in things like computational number theory. But anyway, uh, what's this KNR? So here's an example. Uh, uh, if, uh, if, K is, if K is just QP, then I think KNR 
is somehow the union of QP, zeta m, uh, let's a little m, there, with, uh, with m an integer at least one, and p doesn't divide m. If you start throwing in nth roots of unity, uh, you're going to be careful. Like QP zeta p is ramified at p. That's kind of bad. But uh, QP zeta m is, uh, is unramified. I think that's probably true. There we go. It's a live exercise generation. It's, is this true for... Uh, I think this is true for general k. I think that, uh, yeah, this must, I think this must be true. Anyway, uh, I don't, we can worry about that later. Uh, I want, yeah. So that's how we build our ramified extensions. We could just, I mean, there's other ways of building them, of course, but here's an example. We can just throw in uh, roots of unity, mth roots of unity for m prime to p. Uh, so now I need to talk about this inertia group, which is, of course, the hard part. And uh, this is the kind of I need to prepare, well, I have prepared, because. Um, this is slightly delicate. So, huh, right, so now let's say, uh, now let's say we've got this extension, L over K as usual. But let me assume the inertia group is finite and assume that I L over K, oh, so I should say Galois, I mean Galois. Uh, let me assume this inertia group is finite. Right, so in particular, if you're me at your age, then you were kind of slightly terrified of infinite Galois groups still. Uh, so you're just pretending that uh, L over K is a finite extension, which is a perfectly reasonable uh, situation to put yourself in. Uh, so e.g., e.g. L over K finite. Right, so what can we say about this gal? You see, the, you know, we're in this finite situation, so we've got this random inertia subgroup. I guess it's a normal subgroup because it's a kernel. Uh, we, know, we know that I L over K is a normal subgroup of gal L over K. And we know that the quotient is, a, I mean, if L over K is finite, we even know that the quotient is a finite cyclic group. Uh, <clears throat> So, need to understand this I L over K. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to put a filtration on it. Let's put a filtration. On I, on I L over K. Uh, and we're going to, you know, that's somehow, it's a good, if you've got some generally complicated mathematical object, if you can put a filtration on it, uh, then we could look at the filter pieces, and maybe that will teach us something about the object. Uh, so I need to explain how to put a filtration on this inertia group. Um, to do that, we have to remember where the inertia group came from, right? Uh, what is, I mean, these things are, you know, if sigma is in, a, if sigma is in I L of a K, then, uh, then sigma is in this Galois group, right? Then sigma is actually a map from L to L, uh, and one can easily check that sigma sends the integers of L to the integers of L. Uh, and sigma sends uh, the maximal ideal of L to the, to the maximal ideal of the integers of L to the maximal ideal of the integers of L. Uh, and the idea is we can kind of ask ourselves how much disruption sigma does to these things here. So let's get this right. Uh, so, hmm. I guess the first thing we need to observe is that in this situation, because I L over K is finite, I claim that P L is principal. Uh, 
now. So let me uh, know that because because I L over K I L over K is finite. There, we actually know that uh, we have that P L is principal. We, this came up in a question uh, yesterday, right? If L was equal to K bar, then of course this thing is infinitely big and L can contain like square roots of P, cube roots of P, nth roots of P for all P. And that was somehow an obstruction to uh, making this principle. But what's happening here is because this inertia group is finite, you see we have, we have L and then we have M and then we have K and this is unramified and this is this and this is I L over K, this is a finite thing, and, uh, and the integers of M contain P M, and because this is unramified, that's still generated by a uniformizer down here, right? We have the integers of K, that contains uh, the maximal ideal of K, and that's, and that's principal, because K is a finite extension of Q P. Up here, it's still principal generated by the same thing, uh, and up here we just have some finite extension, so it doesn't cause too much problems. I mean, uh, up here we, I mean, I should perhaps tell you that kind of VL uh, curses. I'm telling you these things in slightly, uh, in a slightly strange order. Apologies. So the, the crucial point I need to make is that VL is on note, and, uh, and VL goes from uh, this, this uh, discrete valuation. Has, uh, satisfies kind of VL is the size of L over, is the size of IL over K multiplied by VK on K star. So that's what's going on. The uh, the valuation uh, the valuation only changes by some part. I'm just spending all this hard work. I mean. Really, I only care about the case where L over K is finite. That's what's going on in my head, anyway. And if L over K is finite, then L is a finite extension of QP, and there's nothing to worry about. Of course, this is principal. Uh, perhaps I should have stuck to that case all along. Anyway, so PL is a PL is a principal generated by some uniformizer pi L, and, and uh, we're going to look at what sigma does to pi L. That's the idea. Uh, so, so here we go then. If I is uh, if I is greater than or equal to one, let's define define I L over K little i. So here's my filtration to be exactly the sigma in I L over K such that sigma of pi L divided by pi L. So all these things, all these, all these elements of these Galois groups, they're all kind of continuous automorphisms, right? So uh, it will send, sigma will send OL to OL, it'll send pi L to pi L, it'll send a generator of, it'll ge send a generator of PL to a generator of PL. Uh, so sigma of pi L will still uh, be a uniformizer of PL. And sigma of pi L divided by pi L, that's going to be a unit. Uh, so that's definitely going to be an OL star. Uh, and now the question is, how, how close is it to 1? So I'm going to say, is this has to be in 1. This is uh, sufficiently important, and I've left not quite enough space for it. So it's the, the elements in IL of a K such that sigma of pi L divided by pi L is in 1 plus PL to the power, this is why I have to have my notes now, because I never quite know, this is I. There. So, that's the filtration that we need to uh, try and understand. So, at the minute it just looks like a random subset. Uh, but, uh, I guess it's not too difficult to check. There's probably a good way of thinking about it, isn't it? It's somehow, 
I rather suspect that this is probably I L over K comma I is probably equal to the sigma which acts as the identity on kind of OK mod P L to the I star. Uh, anyway, so there's a definition. Uh, right. Oh, and I should say also, so I, it would be nice, sometimes it's nice to talk about I L over K zero. Let's also, let's set I L over K zero just to be I L over K. So there we are. And sometimes people even define 1 plus PL to the 0 to be a OK OL star. That's a little bit, I don't know. Right. So there's some random, uh, there's some random definition. So now what we can check, not too hard. Uh, that these things are subgroups, right? So I L over K equals I L over K zero, and that contains I L over K one, and that contains I L over K two, oops, I L over K two, there. And that these are all subgroups. Uh, Oh, curses, really? If I set I is 1, I want to get the pro P, I want to get the Sulov subgroup. I'm telling you secrets that's coming later. Do you think I've got that? Yeah, the automorphisms. So this is definitely a unit. I, I, I'm still not understanding the problem. I think I think everything on the board is fine. Uh, let's let's go carefully, and let's see what happens because I'm about to say more things about. Uh, yeah. Uh, so let's check this. This is this. This lives in this. Oh, these are all subgroups. Uh, are all subgroups of I L over K. Uh, then they're all normal in G L over, and they're all normal in Gal L over K. I L over K, comma I, is a normal subgroup of Gal L over K. And also, remember I L over K is finite, and uh, and if something in I L over K actually fixes pi L, uh, then. If sigma fixes pi L, then I think sigma must be the identity. Uh, because it fixes M, I see, yes, because, because L is generated over M. Yeah, this is kind of handy, isn't it? L is M pi L. So if sigma fixes pi L, then it fixes all of L, so it must be the identity, because it fixes M. So furthermore, uh, I've just shown that if sigma is not the identity, then it moves pi L. So sigma pi L over pi L won't be 1, so it won't be 1 mod pi L to the i for i sufficiently large. So furthermore, if i is sufficiently large, uh, 
then this inertia subgroup is going to be the trivial group. There. So we have a filtration on this inertia subgroup by more subgroups, uh, and, event, and this is a finite filtration. Right. So now this is where we're going to unravel whether or not I've got things wrong. Uh, so as I say, the motivation for introducing this filtration is because I want to, uh, I want to understand the quotients. And now here's the trick. Uh, so, uh, so note next that this I L over K, if I quotient out by I L over K1, uh, I'm going to write down a map from this. I'm going to embed this into K L star there. And that map is going to be sigma goes to, I need to come up with an element of K L star, and it's going to be sigma of pi L, sigma of pi L over pi L. Where's Jackie? Are you happy yet? You're happy. Wonderful. Uh, so there's some interesting thing. This is, this is possibly infinite, remember, but uh, this is a finite group, and a finite subgroup with the multiplicative group of a field is going to be cyclic, and furthermore, it's going to be cyclic of order prime to p. And in particular, the size of I L over K modulo I L over K1 uh, is prime to P. Uh, well, now I can even say this, this entire group here is cyclic of order prime to P. So that's kind of nice, because remember we had the full Galois group, and then we realized that this was a cyclic part, the unramified part, and then this complicated inertia part. And we've just pulled another part of inertia off, and it's still relatively simple. Cyclic of order prime to p. Uh, but now, of course, the bad news is that I over k comma 1 uh, can be a little bit more complicated. In some sense, the, the I L over k comma 1 part is the, uh, is the real meat of this inertia group. But, uh, but we can say something about it. Because uh, uh, note also that if I is at least one, then uh, then I L over K comma I modulo I L over K I plus one. So again, the sort of the general term in this filtration. So stuff in here, sigma pi L is 1, sigma pi L over pi L is 1 mod pi L to the i. Yeah, there's some issue. There's something, we can do something with pi L to the i over pi L to the i plus 1, I think. So let's do this. So I'm going to map this into pi L to the i over pi L to the i plus 1. Uh, so I, maybe I should say this is isomorphic to, this is isomorphic to kind of K L. As a group under addition, as an as an abelian group, uh, this is a this is the additive group because P, P L is principal, so this is non canonically isomorphic to this, uh, and the map here is sigma goes to sigma pi L over pi L, so sigma is in I L over K to the I, so that's in one plus P L to the I, so I'm simply going to take away one. And that's in PL to the I. And if I'm in, if sigma is in this thing here, then uh, then this will be zero, because it will be in PL to the I plus one. So there we go. So in particular, uh, remember this is a possibly infinite. This is a finite. This is a finite group. I've now proved it's abelian, uh, and it's a finite subgroup of this. This is a possibly infinite. This could be a finite field of characteristic p, or possibly in, infinite field. But uh, as a vector space, it's a vector space over the field with p elements. And so this is some finite-dimensional subspace. So in particular, this is uh, 
this is now some finite dimensional vector space over the field with p elements, and in particular, it has order of power of p. Uh, and in particular, this thing here, i l over k, i over i l over k, i plus 1, uh, is isomorphic to z mod p z to some power, uh, to some power, whatever, n i. Uh, so it has order of power of p. There. It's also abelian, right? All these quotients have been abelian. This random, this inertia group is kind of a random group. It's certainly not going to be abelian in general, but we've just written some, some filtration on it, and uh, and all the sub quotients turn out to be abelian and relatively simple as well. Uh, so there, there's what we need about these inertia groups. Remember, I'm always assuming that these inertia groups are finite here. So these, these need to be checked. One needs to check that these are injective group homomorphisms, as I say, but these are not so hard, right? So these are relatively simple exercises. But I think. I did maybe put them on the example sheet. So these are. Uh, so although we haven't completely worked out what this inertia group is, but one upshot is that i l over k one. Uh, this has got order of power of p, uh, and it's a normal subgroup, and the quotient has order prime to p, normal subgroup of this inertia group. Uh, it's the unique, oops, it's the unique Sulov P subgroup. Of I L over K. So there you go, and the quotient, uh, and the quotient is cyclic. It's cyclic of order prime to p. There. So we're trying to understand this Gower group. You know, now let L be k bar. That doesn't, I mean, that doesn't make sense because these things aren't finite. But the idea is that somehow uh, we should be able to take some kind of limit. And now this inertia group, we've pulled off some relatively simple bits. And what's left is a p group. Uh, in particular, it's solvable, right? Ah, so maybe I should say so, you know, hence, in particular, this I L of a K is a solvable group, uh, which was not obvious at the time. Uh, but I don't know. So, well, maybe I should say the, um, the extensions... There's a name for extensions of which I L over K1 is trivial. Uh, if uh, we, say, we say that L over K is tamely ramified, if, if I L over K1 uh, is trivial. So, uh, so this notation has a slightly funny consequence that somehow tamely ramified, that sounds like, it sounds like you're implying that you're ramified, but that it's not too bad. Uh, and at some point in everyone's life, in fact, I've had several PhD students ask me independently, at some point in your life, you realize that you don't quite know if an unramified extension is tamely ramified, because somehow tamely ramified seems to imply a little bit ramified. Uh, so in some sense, the, the fault is with the notation. So note, maybe I should just flag this completely. Unramified extensions are tamely ramified. That's a that's a trivial remark mathematically, 
Uh, this is more a linguistic note, that tame doesn't imply it exists. Uh, so. so there we go. There's some, there's some tamely ramified extensions. And uh, um, wild is the opposite of tame. So if, uh, if I, L over K, comma, 1 uh, is not trivial, we say L over K is wildly ramified. And wildly ramified certainly does imply ramified, right? Uh, so there's no linguistic issues there. Uh, so there's that. But as I say, what we're really interested in, so now there's a, a sort of slightly tedious technical thing. Uh, so we're really interested in um, in the case kind of L equals K bar, because I'm trying to state the local Langlands conjectures, and these have got something to do with representations of gal K bar over K. Uh, but of course, none of the discussion above applies in this situation. Uh, but then I L over K is not finite. Yeah. So we have to work out how to glue everything together uh, and, take, and take some kind of limit. And unfortunately, this lower numbering does not behave well uh, with respect to extensions. So this lower numbering There, this lower numbering i l over k comma i. It's called the lower numbering because the numbers that are appearing are, are subscripts. Uh, does not behave uh, well with respect to extensions of l. So I'll just leave that slightly informal, but what I'm trying to say is basically you change L to L primed, which is a bit bigger and kind of and ramified, uh, then, then PL changes to PL primed and PI L changes to PI L primed. And your definition, you, this definition of this filtration it involved what happened to PI L. So you make some ramified extension of L and then PI L changes completely. Uh, and all your numbering has kind of gone wrong. Uh, so, You, somehow, what, what I'm saying is that the image, I mean, I, I guess I could make a precise statement. Let me make a precise statement. Uh, I, I, if I've got L primed over L over K, and I, L primed over K is finite, and everything is Galois, so L primed over K, and L over K Galois, and, and this thing here, uh, then, uh, then there's a natural map from I L primed over K uh, that's going to surject onto I L over K. That's kind of easy. Uh, but unfortunately, but I L primed over K, comma I doesn't get sent to, uh, doesn't become identified. With, uh, with I L over K, I, via the natural map. So that's what happens in general. And like you do the calculation, you try to prove this is true, and you just get stuck. And the reason you get stuck is because it's not true. Because pi L primed is completely unrelated to pi L, basically. And so you're trying to, you know, uh, the, I've lost the definition, but you're trying to control things modulo P L to the I. But this is a question about P L prime to the I, which has nothing to do with P L to the I. I mean, it's to do with P L to the kind of I times E or something, where E is the amount that this is. You see, there's some scaling issue. This, this will be something to do with I L of a K of I times E. That will be what's going on. Uh, so this is kind of fixed in a rather beautiful way. Uh, so, so there's a fix. There's a, there's a, there's a rather crazy fix. Uh, we introduce a new, uh, introduce a new uh, 
some uh, relabeling of the of, of the filtration. Uh, of the filtration. And I'll spare you the details, uh, but here's the idea. If, um, so let's have back to, so forget about L primed, we've got uh, L over K Galois, and we'll have I L over K finite, as before. Uh, and what I'm going to do is I just need to introduce some numbers. I'm not going to prove the big theorem. Uh, as I say, the proof is rather fiddly and in Sayre's book on local fields, for example. So let me define a, let me set gi is the size of i L over k, comma i. So gi is some random integer. So the, I guess g, g0 is at least g1 is at least, is at least kind of, whatever, G capital M is one uh, for, for some sufficiently large N. Uh, so there's GI, and now let me define completely out of the blue, and let me define, this map is traditionally called phi, uh, from the non-negative reals to the non-negative reals. Uh, and it's some slightly ridiculous definition it's going to be piecewise linear, uh, and it's going to have possible breakpoints at integers. So, so phi phi is is piecewise linear there, uh, and uh, and so I guess with breaks, I mean, so somehow in fact phi is phi is linear. On, on all kind of intervals, i comma i plus one. Oh, so it's piecewise linear and continuous. There, if I was linear on i comma i plus one, so the graph of phi looks like this. It's gonna, that's what it's, uh, so five zero is zero. And the last thing I need to tell you is what the slope is on i comma i plus one. Uh, So phi is just supposed to be some decent scaling factor. And again, I've got to be, I've got to be note bound to make sure I get this right. So. And on, uh, and on, I, I comma I plus one. Uh, phi has a slope uh, G I plus one over G zero. So there we go. So the G I is getting smaller. G zero, G zero might be big. G zero is the size of the full inertia group. Then these I's get smaller and smaller and smaller. And so this picture I drew here is kind of fairly accurate, and at least. Uh, you start off with the biggest slope, and then the slopes get smaller. I mean, maybe I'll say, so maybe I'll give any, somehow an even better picture. You start off with quite a, you start off with slope hmm, g1 over g0, and then you get g2 over g0, g3 over g0, and eventually at some point, uh, all, all the GIs become one, uh, and so you get slope one over G zero there. So eventually this, this is slope one over G zero if, uh, if U is very, very large. So that's what phi looks like. So it's easy to check that phi is uh, an increasing bijection, right? So phi zero infinity to zero infinity is an increasing bijection, strictly increasing bijection. And we're just going to use phi to kind of rescale the filtration. Okay? So uh, let's define if V is in the reals, V is at least zero, let me define the lower numbering 
i l over k comma v. So remember, we've defined this for v an integer, but let me just define i l over k v to be i l over k the ceiling of v. Uh, so now my filtration, it used to be, uh, I used to have a filtration uh, that was defined on every integer, and now I've got a filtration which is defined on every real number. But of course, uh, it's, not really, it's not really anything new. So, so here, v, here v means it's the smallest integer i, which is greater than to v. There's my definition of ceiling of v. Uh, so now I have a lower numbering indexed by the real numbers, and so now I finally get the upper numbering. So definition is the upper numbering. Uh, let me define i. So here we've got u is in the real numbers at least zero. I L over K U with the upper numbering is by definition I L over K some lower numbering thing and it's phi inverse of U. There we go. So there's some there's some kind of linear rescaling and now you uh, and now if you grit your teeth and uh, and do the calculation, it turns out that um, this, is the, this, is, this filtration is well behaved when you start changing. You, now you replace L by L primed, and uh, the lower numbering starts jumping around, but also, of course, all these GIs start jumping around as well. And the point about phi is it kind of controls the jumping precisely. Uh, so, so the proposition that I won't prove, so proof in there. Uh, I think it's in ser local fields, uh, or maybe Castle Sprelly. Uh, is that this this new renormalized upper numbering? Uh, if uh, if L primed over L over K, these are all Gawa as usual. Uh, extensions or or all Gawa and I L primed over K is finite. So we're in the situation we've been talking about, then this upper numbering is good. Then uh and I L over K U upper U is exactly the image of I L primed over K upper U via the obvious map. Proof omitted. Uh, so oh, apparently, uh, apparently, Castles and Froelich, page thirty-eight. Apparently, if L prime over K is finite. So there we go. So that's how. Uh, maybe I should say. Uh, where did I do it? I. So I defined this here. So I've got my filtration, which is defined, you know, it jumps, it's, it's defined on the integers, and then I've defined this filtration here. I've let V be a real number. And so now if you kind of look at the graph of IL over KV, uh, then it somehow, then the graph jumps, right? So there's somehow the size. Maybe I should draw. So here's a, you know, here's a graph of... Uh, V goes to the size of I L over K V with the lower numbering. The graph kind of looks like this. Here we get G zero, and then the moment, uh, and then the moment we leave, uh, it goes like this there to G one. Now here's one, and then, uh, and then that lives there, and then that lives there. So I'm trying to, I'm trying to indicate the the continuity somehow. G uh, this uh, I L over K one is really I L over K one minus epsilon, but it's not I L over K one plus epsilon. There. So you see, this graph jumps. 
at, at random v's in the integers. Uh, and so when we use the upper numbering as well, so uh, what about the graph? The graph of u goes to i l over k upper numbering u. So this is going to have jumps as well because it's just some rescaling has jumps. But because I've done this weird rescaling, like with kind of random slopes here, like 1 over g0, with g0 some random size of some group, uh, these slopes, these jumps might not be at integers anymore. Uh, jumps may not be in z. Uh, but if you think about it, they are going to be in Q. There. And in fact, you can do even more. You can, you can say even better because the slope is always some whole number divided by G0. So I guess the, the denominators of where the jumps are uh, will divide G0. So there we go. Uh, so the point of all this is that with the upper numbering, these things glue together very well. Uh, and so for the upper numbering, this upper numbering will, it, uh, will extend to an infinite extension. Uh, oh, so while I'm here, let me tell you, although I don't think we're going to need it, let me tell you the hassa arf theorem. It's kind of a crazy theorem of crazy name, crazy theorem. Uh, Here's a random thing just for your, I don't think we're going to need it, but for your edification. Uh, if, if L over K is abelian, then the jumps in the upper numbering are also at integers. Then, uh, then the uh, jumps in the upper numbering, I, L over K, U, are are always integers. I have no real understanding about why that's true. Well, I mean, it's just some random fact. So, so for a random extension, these jumps will be at random rational numbers. But if the extension is abelian, then uh, the jumps are always at integers. As I say, this is in contrast to the lower numbering, where the jumps are always at integers just by definition. Uh, so there's Hasserath. And so now, of course, Let's, let's glue everything together. Uh, and so finally, we can talk about L equals K bar. Now if any, so now if L is, uh, if L over K now is any Galois extension, There, we can define, so, I, L over K, U, there, by gluing together, you know, by gluing I, I, M over K, U, for, uh, for M over K, uh, whatever, algebraic, and m i m over k finite. So there. So now we have. So now we have a filtration on this inertia group that makes sense, even in the infinite case. So there you go. Uh, and that's kind of all we can say about that filtration, really. Uh, but it's somehow a useful, it's something, it's, uh, yeah, it's a useful tool. Right, let's get back to, uh, how are we doing for time? When did I start? I'm, I speak till 10.45, right? Yeah, great. I, you kids have probably not really ever given too many lectures, but I must say that it is an absolute luxury being able to speak for two and a half hours every day because you always feel that you have a lot to say, but somehow you have so much time to say it. How are you doing? Oh, any, any, I'm just going to start going about something else now. Any questions? That's what you're supposed to say in America, right? Americans say that all the time. No, they're real numbers now, right? Yeah, this is a kind of a... 
using the real numbers. But, um, but they only jump at rational numbers. <laughs> it's, quite, it's quite difficult to draw functions, which is somehow. Yeah. Uh, I, once, I once asked John Coates if this function was somehow continuous at every irrational and jumped at every rational. And he was like, oh, I think so. And he somehow went to his office and he came back with a, somehow a handwritten letter from Tate where he'd sketched some argument. And uh, Coates had kept it, which so is indeed the case. I can't remember how. If Tate did it, it's probably tricky. So it might be a very hard exercise to check that for a random rational number u, you can find some L over k for which the thing jumps at u. Uh, anyway. So now we don't need it now, right? The, yeah, so here, if I am okay, it's fine. I, then I've, defi I've defined this. I've now just defined this, right? I'm going to define that to be, uh, yeah, the, it's going to be the stuff in I L over K that lands in I M over K U uh, for some appropriately chosen M. Yeah, for all, I guess for all M, that's the point. Uh, right, so recall... Uh, so recall, I defined L over K to be tamely ramified. To be tamely ramified if, um, if uh, so this was when, this was when I L over K finite. I defined tamely ramified if I, if I L over K one was trivial, okay? But now we've done this, this crazy introducing a real number. Uh, this is equivalent to, of course, this is kind of equivalent to uh, I L over K comma epsilon is trivial for all epsilon bigger than zero, you see. It means that uh, you have some interesting inertia group, but then the moment you move away from zero, it becomes trivial, you see. And, uh, and of course, this is equivalent to... Uh, I L over K delta equals one for all delta bigger than zero. Uh, and of course, this now makes sense for arbitrary extensions. Uh, and this last definition is good for any for any Galois L over K. Yeah. I mean, you can, e you can even define what it means for, an un for a not Galois extension to be tame, but I'm not so interested. Uh, so same story, tame extension, if two, so com compositum of two tame extensions is tame. Of two tame extensions is tame. There, and uh, now we have the language. Uh, so therefore we can talk about maximal tame extensions. Therefore, L over K contains a maximal, just like it contained a maximal unramified extension, it contains a maximal tamely ramified extension. There. Uh, yeah, why not? That works. That works for me. So I guess for a general, so now here's our general picture then. So L over K is Galois, there's L and there's K, and there's something here, somehow there's a, there's some kind of K1 and this is maximal unramified extension. And now there's some K2 here. And this is the maximal tamely ramified extension. Uh, maximal tamely ramified extension. I've, just, I've written this picture, and I've realized, actually, it's a, it's a nice picture about which I want to say more. So let me just write it again. There's L, here's K2, here's K1, and here's K right down the bottom there. So this is unramified. 
and this is tamely ramified. Uh, and this is the wild part. So wild. This is wildly ramified. And in this generality now, because L is a random extension, L can now be k bar, because I've done all this work with this phi. L can now be k bar, uh, and so this can be some huge infinite extension. Uh, but the Gower group will be pro p there. I mean, in the finite case, it will be a finite p group, and in the infinite case, it would be a projective limit of finite p groups. So if you know about pro p groups, there's, there's still some good theory of, you know, there's Sulov's theorems and stuff like this. There's orders, and uh, somehow this just says the order of this is p to the power infinity, as it were. Uh, and... Uh, yeah, and this we understand, this is, got Gau, this is Gauar group is cyclic, and this one here we also saw in the cases when L over K was finite, this Gauer group was cyclic of order prime to P. So we have a cyclic extension, a cyclic extension, a pro P extension. So that's what the absolute Gauer group of K looks like from this point of view. Let me say more about why this tame extension, uh, let me explicitly tell you what this tame, this maximal tamely ramified extension is. It's not so difficult. Uh, Well, let me do the case. Let me do the case of um, k bar. So we've got k bar, and here we have k t, and here k n r, and here's k there. So this is the maximal tamely ramified extension. So how is this going to work? Uh, well. So what is kt, right? That's just... Uh, so I can, I can tell you what it is. So let's, let's go back to if L over k is finite in Gawa, uh, then we saw, then, uh, then we have this picture, L there. So now I'm going to go back to k2, k1. Uh, and this extension here, this had Gower group I L over K modulo I L over K1. And this turned out to be, this was cyclic of order prime to P, M, if P doesn't divide M. There. So this Gower group here, is cyclic of order prime to p, and in particular, it's cyclic. And there's something called Kummer theory, which I learned about in Birch's article. I found Castle's Frehley quite an intimidating book when I was your age, but the, uh, my, entry, my entry point into that book was somehow Birch's article. Uh, because I'd done a course in Galois theory, and I found that really Birch was only really doing... I, I need, I did, my commutative algebra was, and so I was a little, still a bit terrified by kind of dedicated domains and stuff like this, but uh, my Galois theory was solid. Uh, and I read Birch's article in Castle's Frelich, and it taught me a lot. And one of the things it taught me was, um, in some cases, you can really write down all the cyclic extensions of order prime to, uh, yeah, you can write down the cyclic extensions of order M of some field, as long as the field contains the nth roots of unity. So now Birch, so maybe I should say, so by Kummer theory, So see, see Birch's article in Castle's Frelich. Uh, so Kummer theory says something about cyclic extensions. So note uh, that this KNR, right, KNR is going to contain all the, uh, all the nth roots of one, right? Uh, the nth roots of one group of nth roots of unity. in K bar. Uh, and that's because, yeah, that's because if, so that's because P doesn't divide M. So throwing in an nth root of unity, we get something unramified. You see, so actually, uh, so if, if kind of K2 over KNR uh, is Galois, 
with Galois group cyclic of order m, z modulo mz, with gamma group isomorphic to a cyclic group of order m, then by Kummer theory, we must have obtained this extension by taking an mth root of something. Uh, then K2 must be kind of KNR as an mth root of alpha for some alpha in KNR. So that's, that's what Kummer theory tells you. The way you get cyclic extensions is by throwing in mth roots there. Uh, it's not too tricky, it's not too hard to check. But in fact, the only uh, K2 must be uh, so, gen I mean, in general, if I take like the rational numbers, the rational numbers certainly contains all the square roots of unity. Uh, what, what, where's my, oh yeah, yeah. So the rational numbers contains all the square roots of unity, plus or minus one, and so the degree two extensions of the rational numbers are what I get by taking a square root of something, like Q root N, Q root P, these are quadratic extensions of Q with Galois group cyclic of order two. But there's lots and lots of different ones. Here we're in some situation uh, where we're, we've taken the maximal unramified extension of some field where there was only one prime anyway, and it turns out that somehow we've unraveled everything and there's only one m, we can only take the mth root of one thing basically. K2 must actually be KNR, uh, mth root of pi k. Yeah. This isn't so difficult to prove, like alpha is pi k to the sum power times a unit and mth roots of units give you unramified extensions. So we must have taken the mth root of some power of pi k and then by just mucking around you can convince yourself that we've taken the mth root of pi k. Uh, and so now, putting this together, we can uh, so so can conclude. Can check now that this tamely ramified extension, this KT. Is actually must be K and R, the union for M at least one, P prime to M, uh, is going to be the union of K and R, M fruits of pi K. So that's what the maximal tamely ramified extension looks like. So the unramified extension, we've taken all the nth roots of unity for M prime to P, and then the tamely ramified extension, we're basically taking the nth roots of P. Uh, if k was equal to qp, I'm just taking the nth roots of p for all that, for all uh, m prime to p. So there's what that tamely ramified extension looks like. Uh, and in particular, I can work out what the Galois group is. Uh, and Gal, well, maybe I should say, maybe I should work out this uh, note that this Gal k n r take an nth root of pi k, what's this Galois group here over k n r? Uh, well, it's cyclic of order m, uh, and here's a way to see it's cyclic of order m. Uh, it's actually isomorphic, it's canonically isomorphic to the nth roots of unity uh, via the map. Sending sigma in the Galois group goes to you see pi k, that's in the base field, so Galois doesn't move pi k, but of course it can take an m through to pi k and send it to a random different m through to pi k. So if I look at sigma of the m through to pi k, and I divide it by the m through to pi k, uh, that's going to be a root of unity. So it turns out this is a group homomorphism and this is an isomorphism. So this Galois group is actually canonically isomorphic to the m roots of unity. Uh, I suppose while I'm here, I could even, so in fact now we've, we've now got some kind of non-canonical isomorphism. It's nice to have canonical isomorphisms because you can write them as equals and somehow you know that all your diagrams will commute. But let me temporarily, uh, let me temporarily write down a non-canonical isomorphism. 
Uh, you see the... You see, the problem is in this issue where I've got, I've got m nth roots of unity. This mu m, the group of nth roots of unity, is certainly cyclic, but I haven't got a canonical generator. Like, if this was the nth roots of unity in the complex numbers, I could kind of take e to the 2 pi i over m. You know, if you really put a gun to my head and demanded I choose a generator of the cyclic, of the nth roots of unity in the complexes, I could choose e to the 2 pi i over m. But in some random field, like an algebraic closure of the periodic numbers, I don't really know how to choose a canonical generator. Uh, so what can we have here, and so hence, so in particular, so, uh, so this gal kt over kr, uh, kn, oh, maybe we're up here, this is equal to the projective limit of these mu m's there. So this would be kind of non-canonically isomorphic to the projective limit of z mod mz's, there, and so this would be, so remember this is all P doesn't divide M, right? So this thing here would equal, to, uh, would equal I guess, the product for L not P, ZL. So this is non-canonical, right? So here's our picture. What we've done today, rather rapidly, but we're somehow there. So here K is my finite extension of QP, and here we have a maximal unramified extension and a maximal tamely ramified extension, and then the algebraic closure up here. This is a pro P group there. This Gower group is non canonically isomorphic uh, to the product for L not P, ZL. And this Gower group is canonically isomorphic to uh, Z hat. Which is the product for L, or the product for all L, ZL. There. And if you'd really rather play with finite extensions, then take a finite Galois extension. Uh, you see, the, this is just, uh, infinite extensions terrified me when I was your age, but somehow this is just packaging of, uh, this is just clever packaging of data about finite extensions. What this says is if I've got a finite Galois extension of p adic fields, then there's a maximal unramified extension, and the Galois group is cyclic with a canonical generator. And then there's a maximal tamely ramified extension, and the Galois group here will be isomorphic to a cyclic group, but with no canonical generator. And then we have a finite P group at the top, right? So I'm making that assertion for all finite extensions at once, and I'm cleverly packaging everything together, which gives you this very fancy looking infinite Galois theory story. But all I'm doing really is taking some direct limit. Uh, so you shouldn't really be, uh, you shouldn't really be, I mean, not only, not only that, but every time I prove something, I reduce to some finite case, and then you do everything for the finite case, and then you take some limit. So it shouldn't really be that scary. Uh, so if I'm trying to understand, if I'm trying to understand this, if I'm trying to understand this big group here, then it would somehow... This pro P group is non-abelian and difficult in general, but at the very least, I should know, it would be nice to understand, here's a group we haven't really quite understood yet, it would be nice to understand that group there, the Gawa group of the maximal tame extension. And the reason we haven't quite understood it is because we've isolated a normal subgroup that's cyclic, and we've got a quotient that's cyclic, but if you just have some random group with a cyclic subgroup and a cyclic quotient, that you have to figure out what the glue is, right? Uh, this is, a, this is going to be a semi-direct product, but to make it a semi-direct product, I need to say how this group acts on this group. So maybe I'll say, uh, maybe I can look at my notes and say what I was supposed to be saying next. But uh, yeah, so, okay, well, I don't care. I'm going to say this, I'm going to say this anyway. So uh, I guess this is a, I mean, exercise. We can now understand Uh, gal, gal kt over k. Uh, as I say, we haven't quite, by understand, I mean, we can really explicitly nail it now. We can write it down. We have a subgroup which is cyclic and a quotient which is cyclic, but we need to say, so uh, we have a cyclic, we have a pro-cyclic sub and a pro-cyclic quotient
And this procyclic quotient is generated by a generated by some canonical generator, right? Uh, a canonical generator. So this generator needs a name. It's going to be called FROB. So what is this FROB? Uh, how do I know that this group is cyclic? Uh, it's because it's the absolute Gower group of some finite field. So let's just remind you of this here. Uh, my Galois group here, Gal, I've got Gal K N R over K. This is canonically isomorphic to Gal, uh, I guess. This Gal group with the residue fields, and this contains this contains the map X goes to X to the power Q. That's the generator of that Galois group. If this is infinite, this is a topological generator. So Q is the size of a the size of the residue field. Uh, so that is a canonical generator of this group, and that gr and that generator there corresponds to some element in this Galois group here, and this is going to be called FROB. Okay, that's the definition. So we've got FROB, this Frobenius element. In here, I was Frobenius would somehow turn in his grave if he saw all this stuff. I would imagine. Uh, so there's a Frobenius, but on the other hand, he'd probably be pleased that his name's gone down in history. Uh, so there's our generator, and the question is basically, I want to see how Frob. You've got to be careful, right? Frob is not an element of Gal K bar over K. Frob is an element of Gal K N R over K. Okay. So now we have to understand, so this is some exercise in finite group theory. That again, I remember when I was your age, I was very unclear about, about how groups glued together. I knew there was something called a semi-direct product, but I didn't really have a good understanding as to it, to what extent that was the answer. Uh, but let me, I mean, now I'll just tell you. You can go out and figure it out yourselves. So we've got this group here, and we've got this group here, and we want to know this group here. Uh, so what do we, so what extra piece of data do we need to figure out? Uh, to give us that glue. Well, we're in a good situation here because this is cyclic and this is abelian. So we can lift FROB. If we lift FROB to gal k tame over k, there, then, uh, so now it's an element of the group that we're trying to understand. Then, of course, then, uh, then it acts by conjugation. on the normal subgroup. On the normal subgroup gal K T over K N R. Right? Uh, so this is just goes to X, whatever, or sigma is probably a good name for it. Sigma goes to Frob Frob uh, Sigma Frob inverse. Uh, and so the point is, this is independent of the choice of lifting, because if I have another lifting, then it will be FROB times an element of this abelian group, and the element of the abelian group uh, will commute with sigma. So to say what this group is, we have to say what this action is. That's, that's, what we, that's, that's the missing piece of information for saying what gal kt over k is. Uh, so... And I told you that uh, this group was non-canonically isomorphic to this thing here, but uh, it's canonically isomorphic to uh, so gal gal kt over kr knr is actually canonically isomorphic to this limit over m of mu m from k bar, right? And so we have to figure out. Uh, so this is a group. And we've just given a map from this group to, we've given a group homomorphism from this group to itself. There's actually an isomorphism, of course, because we can just conjugate by FROB inverse to get back to where we start. So the missing piece of data is an isomorphism from this group to itself. So the exercise is, is to check that FROB, check that, uh, uh, check that uh, the map induced by FROB
by Frob uh, is actually the obvious for a bit. Remember where Frob comes from on the residue field is x goes to x to the power of q. Uh, and it turns out that that's exactly, every, you see, this is a, the reason I've written it this way now, this is a canonical isomorphism. And so all the diagrams you should ever write down are going to commute, you see. And so we have to now guess how Frobenius is going to act on a group which is canonically this. And Frobenius is something to do with x goes to x to the q. And x goes to x to the q makes sense here because q is a power of p and m is prime to p. So you check the map induced by Frob is simply the map zeta goes to zeta to the power of q. You see. So there's the, uh, so there's the glue. So this is the glue. Uh, which is tell telling us what this Galois group is, what Gal KT over K is. KT over K. So there you go. So there's the, uh, there's the answer. I don't think we get... I don't think we're really going to... I mean, this is just some parenthetical remark in some sense. You know, what, what I'm saying is, just because we know that this is cyclic and this is cyclic, it doesn't quite tell us what the... You know, there's still some lemma to be checked before we actually know what this group is. But there we go. So now we've got this group here, which is a big semi-direct product of a cyclic group by a cyclic group, and then we've got this funny pro-P group, about which I said essentially nothing. Uh, oh, and I'm even over time. I'm really sorry. It's a good place to stop, but uh, it's a bad place to stop in terms of being seven minutes late. So we'll break for 15. Uh, so I'll start seven minutes late for the next one. So next is going to be statements of local class field theory, just to let you know.